Democracy's weekly live discussion. Uh, I'm Mary Fitzgerald. I'm the editor-in-chief of Open Democracy. Uh, Open Democracy exists to challenge power, inspire change. Um, we do awesome investigative journalism, comment analysis, debate. Um, do sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already and follow us on social media. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Um, we want this conversation to involve you as much as possible. So thanks to everyone who submitted comments and questions ahead of time. We'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, if you're joining us from Zoom, uh, you know, you have a question or comment, you can click um, on the chat icon um, uh, and participate in that way. We'll try and come to as, as many of your comments as questions as we can. If you're joining us from Facebook, your input will be fed back to the moderator. Um, please forgive any technical hitches, interruptions from pets or children or sirens. Um, we're broadcasting from lockdown or semi-lockdown um, across many uh, different continents. Um, so please bear with us for any unscheduled interruptions. Um, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce this panel today. It's uh, a subject um, that uh, is very close to our heart. And um, uh, Rosebug um, Kagamiri, who's a feminist activist, is going to be leading this discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to her to, um, to chair and to introduce our fabulous panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, it's a great pleasure for, to join you eat this evening with a, a panel from um, Kenya, London, uh, to discuss uh, what's happening in Kenya over uh, women's rights. And with me, uh, I'll first introduce Nerima Akinyiwere, who is a human rights lawyer from Kenya, Legal and Ethics Issues Network, Kelin. Uh, we'll be also joined by Hema Fernandez from Women's Link Worldwide. She's a human rights lawyer. Uh, then another person joining us would be Ruth Mumbi, who's a community activist uh, from Kenya. And last but not least, to be joined by Adam Ramsey, who is the Open Democracy Editor. And he's been tracking citizen go tactics in Europe, and will be sharing those on how we can learn then how they're working within the Kenyan context. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, We'll start with uh, Nerima to set for us the, um, uh, the discussion in terms of uh, giving us the contextual uh, background to this issue. What have been, um, what, what are women's rights like in Kenya uh, right now in the recent past and how this all relates to the current bill that uh, is being uh, debated on reproductive healthcare uh, rights uh, of women. Welcome, Nerima. We can't hear you, Nerima. You're muted. Please unmute. Nerima, can you hear me? I can't hear Nerima, so we'll, we'll go next to Ruth Mumbi. Could you share with us, uh, as a community activist, um, the situation in Kenya regarding women's rights and in the lead up to this uh, bill and why it's very important, um, why this bill is very important? Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Rosbell and everyone. And I really appreciate uh, you having me here. And also, I appreciate Open Democracy for organizing this uh, uh, webinar, which is very uh, critical. And uh, as you said, I'm an, a community activist and I've been working in the uh, informal settlements of uh, Nairobi. And majorly, I'm an activist who has been working on issues of uh, class, oppression, economic empowerment of uh, vulnerable women in the informal settlement of Nairobi. And uh, to me, uh, this matter of a reproductive health bill, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a, an issue that attaches me directly. As an activist who has been uh, on the forefront of rescuing young girls uh, who have been uh, defiled, uh, raped, and um, um, uh, some even uh, 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 impregnated uh, through, uh, through rape, 
And also, I've also been working closely with survivors of unsafe abortion who later get a, a lot of uh, uh, stigmatization, trauma, being labeled all sorts of names. I've also worked with a group uh, of uh, women sex workers, you know, and for me, uh, the Reproductive Health Rights Bill, it's a, it's a, it's a bill that has come to empower uh, women because uh, I've, I've been uh, living, I was born and raised in, in the slum, so I've, I've watched even people that I know, young women that, have, uh, uh, that we even used to, uh, to play with, being victims, dying, and dying out of a backstreet abortion, some even uh, uh, getting, um, uh, complications, uh, some even going to an extent of even having uh, to live uh, with a disability. Um, and uh, when uh, uh, they try to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to get uh, services, uh, we, ha we, ha we are from a community where by even getting access, having access to information on reproductive rights, young women uh, and uh, even women uh, are really, uh, they don't have that power even to control their bodies. The bodies are controlled by uh, uh, people uh, and uh, men. Uh, so uh, this, the debate on reproductive health rights, it's very critical and emotional in the in this in this community so when we have laws that can empower uh, women uh, for me and other activists and also for women who are uh, affected by these issues which are uh, in in most cases it's a class issue because um uh unsafe abortion um maternal deaths and also uh, having lack of proper information. It doesn't affect an elite women. It affects uh, uh, poor women who are living in the informal settlement. So for us, uh, having uh, um, a legal or rather laws that give us that power, it's very critical for us because it's going to, uh, to save a whole generation from these uh, deaths that are uh, th that are occurring due due to uh, back backstreet abortions. So uh, for me, uh, I think this is, uh, the law comes at, um, at 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 a time where we need it most, and uh, um, I think it's important for international. Uh, international organization to leave this debate for Kenyan women to decide what they want to do with their bodies. This is a Kenyan agenda. We are the people who are struggling. We are the people who are dying. So people coming to, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to infiltrate on our politics, I think it's not even proper. They should leave this agenda to the Kenyan women to decide, and especially to the women who are living in the, in the low income areas to have that power to decide on whatever they want to do with their bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. That was really um, uh, interesting perspective from somebody who is at the front line of this uh, um, issue because often people discuss women's bodies and women's rights from a very abstract point of view and often talk about issues like abortion, contraception, but these are not issues they have to make decision about in their daily life. So it's very, very important to center the people who are really affected by these, who have to make these dangerous decisions in an environment like that. And uh, just to say also that within the, within in Kenya, whether it's in Kenya or um, in neighboring Uganda, these are very common themes and where women's decision making is not considered and it continues to be sidelined. And um, there are people that have a very powerful hand in making laws, making policies, um, not necessarily the people who are going to use these services. So Ruth, you bring up a very important issue. Um, but also uh, talking about uh, how the, then the decisions uh, that are made by policymakers are not necessarily serving um, the women and the girls that need this most, especially at this time uh, when COVID uh, lockdowns and school closures have really had a big impact uh, across this continent in terms of girls' rights in, in the section reproductive um, uh, health. Uh, and I think the numbers that we are seeing in Kenya skyrocketing in terms of teen pregnancies, in terms of, um, in terms of an site for abortion that are going on, both in Kenya and in different countries in, in, in Africa, is a kind of uh, um, 
a, a recognition or it's just like a reminder that we have not been prioritizing these issues for a long time and COVID is here to tell us that you know our women are not safe in our in our homes because or girls are not safe in the communities when they're out of school it's been uh, just four four months of school closure have had such a huge impact and uh, and kind of determined um, the the path or discontinued so many young girls paths to education to a good life so these are not issues i wanted to reiterate that these are issues that affect people personally uh, not something to just leave um to people that are unaffected. So that, that said, I wanted to bring in Hema in terms of, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, foreign influence um, in terms of policies in, in Africa, in different countries. And one of the groups that uh, feature prominently is Citizen Go, which is best in Madrid, um, where you're best. So would like to hear your perspective in terms of what they have been able to do there and how they are doing this in, in, in Africa. Hema, you can take over now. Thank you very much, Roswell. Um, and also thank you very much to, for having me and uh, to Open Democracy for organizing this uh, really interesting and needed conversation. Um, so yeah, Women's Link, we are um, a women's rights organization working uh, using the law to advance uh, the rights of women and girls. Um, and from our uh, um, office in Madrid, Spain, we've been also um, suffering and monitoring the, the actions of, of, of this uh, type of groups. And I would like to just give a brief overview um, of uh, who they are and their, what have been their main uh, strategies and uh, tactics used uh, in Spain um, to fight uh, and to oppose reproductive rights and other women's rights. Um, so Citizen Go is a foundation uh, registered and headquartered in, in Madrid, Spain. Um, it was created in 2013 um, by the president of Arteoir, which is another um, uh, Spanish organization. I would say it's like their Spanish branch. Um, and they are an ultra-conservative Catholic organization which operates yes, as, as, the, as, as the main brand in, in, in the country. Um, so according to Spanish media reports, Citizen Go has a staff of around 80 people um, in Spain and a budget of 4.6 million uh, of euros in for 2016. Um, they have strong connections with the World Congress of Families, um, with conservative, radical, Catholic and Christian groups in the US, in Russia, uh, in Latin America and worldwide. Um, in Spain particularly, they also have strong connections with the far-right political party Vox, uh, which is something very particular of the way they are operating the, in the country. Um, they have also created their own news agency called Actual, where they give voice to generally anti-reproductive rights, anti-same-sex marriage advocates, and uh, also to supporters of conservative Christian family values uh, and defenders of prenatal life. Um, and then some of the um, main strategies that we've seen them using, which I think is useful to share, because um, something I think they do is they um, you should often export these strategies to different contexts. Uh, so what we've seen in Spain is they've, there, there's a strong articulation against the gender ideology or what has come, the so-called gender ideology, and they have been running these um, buses uh, with um, spreading transphobic messages and anti-feminist messages in 2017 and 2019. Uh, and then another also um, big campaign of theirs was the Parental Pin, which is um, a measure uh, promoted uh, by this uh, organization together with political party Vox, which allows families to prevent their children to attend classes in school with contexts uh, with contents around effective and comprehensive sexual education during school uh, school hours. So very much opposing comprehensive uh, sexual education, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, because they are working also a lot on this in in in, in Africa and East Africa particularly. Another um, a strategy of theirs is the use of malicious litigation, we, we call it, and they've, done, they've been very active um, litigating against sexual reproductive um, rights service providers. Um, so they've worked, they have like um, uh, an allied organization, which is like the Christian Lawyers uh, Association, 
um, and together with them, they've denounced uh, IPPF's main association in, in Spain. Um, and the Spanish Association of uh, Clinics, for, which, are, um, um, which conduct the termination of pregnancies. And they've denounced them before the courts for allegedly providing false information on their websites um, with the aim of inciting women to have abortions, not totally telling them about the counter effects, and for advertising abortion drugs uh, in their web pages. Um, another also litigation strategy they've used is um, uh, filing cases for uh, accusing people of offending religious beliefs. So they've used uh, these uh, against um, feminist activists, against any type of artists when they express within, uh, through their art, express any criticism to any uh, religion or uh, to the Catholic Church or the, basically the Catholic Church, but different other religions. Um, and most of these cases are really dismissed based on the right to freedom of expression and there, ha there, there has only been really one case where a violation uh, uh, has been found. Uh, but then what's important about these strategies, the cases attract a lot of media attention and most of the times uh, the defendants also need to spend a lot of resources on defending themselves, so it's really disrupting. Um, and they uh, have also been using litigation against the government. So particularly now in Spain, there's a, like a socialist uh, left-wing um, government and they have been really active um, suing the government for the management of their response to COVID and for granting access to reproductive rights, uh, including abortion during the pandemic. Um, they've been you know, uh, suing the government for, for this. Um, so I guess the, the, the legal wing, I would say, is a very strong bet for the organization. They, I think they have a special, specific funding for, for this. And their use of litigation has a very strong communications component, which is key to their work. And they are very active communicating the filing of their cases and applications. Uh, but then they never communicate, obviously, about the finding of disability finding or whenever their cases have been dismissed. Um, and they also use legal avenues that not, are not necessarily suitable for the purpose that they are person, but they still uh, just uh, use it for the purpose of winning, not the, before the courts, but winning the communications uh, battle. Uh, and another, they're very active in social media and in communications and um, the use of uh, pseudoscientific discourse is also something that they and do uh, loads, specifically uh, with arguments against abortion. Um, you know, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm sure you're very uh, familiar with, with this already. So, well, I, I, I can comment a little bit more later, but I, I guess uh, as a conclusion, I think um, is obviously that Citizen Go is headquartered in, in Spain, but from there they export strategies worldwide and adapt them to different contexts. And that is why I think it's important to, to know how they operate in other countries so that somehow we can anticipate what their strategies and actions uh, will be in other countries. They are really global and that is why I think a coordinated response from us, uh, from those of us with defending rights is uh, needed. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, that's a very good uh, set, setting stage in terms of looking at uh, um, the global reach of these organizations. Uh, I'm going back to Nerima, who is back with us. Uh, I wanted Nerima to be uh, to go through for us the situation, uh, uh, the state of right, women's rights in Kenya, and what necessitates this kind of uh, bill to come before the parliament in Kenya and, 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 and just uh, look a little through what the, the bill says and, and, and what the hope is in this bill. Nerima, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Rosemary, uh, Rosebell, sorry, and I'm so sorry, previously my computer froze, but just to jump into the discussion, so this would be, I think, the fourth attempt that we've had with our parliament since 2013 to have a productive health and rights bill or a productive health care bill. So we've had a productive health care bill with the 11th parliament. We've had a surrogacy bill, an assisted reproductive technologies bill, and then now we have this bill. 
And this is all came from the fact that um, the right to reproductive health services or the right to reproductive health is guaranteed within our constitution in Article 43.1a. And this was specifically um, noted in the constitution, not because the right to health by itself doesn't include this, but because of the previous discrimination that occurred within how women or girls could access reproductive health services or the meaning of reproduction. So we even have a provision within our non-discrimination clause that includes pregnancy status. And this is because it's been an issue within our country whereby your pregnancy can be the reason for your lack of employment or for your dismissal from a job or for really blocking many of your opportunities. So the fact that our constitution in three separate sections, so Article 26.4 on the right to terminate a pregnancy Article 43.1a on the right to health, and then Article 27 recognizes reproductive health or reproduction as an issue is because of our history and how this has been used to exclude women from many different spaces. And now to go specifically to the issue on abortion within our framework, we have about 464,000 abortions annually in this country. And a recent study, a 2018 study by the Ministry of Health working with the African Population and Population Health Research Council found that about half a billion, half a billion Kenyan shillings a year is spent on post-abortion care within the public health facilities. So we do have a, a large number of induced abortions within this country. And they are one of the top five causes of maternal mortality in Kenya. However, in 26, and in addition to that, in 2016, when our state, our government, the executive sought to have a free maternity program, they included post-abortion care within that. So it's recognizing that there's been a consistent need to take care of women's rights. There's been a consistent need to ensure that women can go through motherhood safely and a consistent need to ensure that choice can be held. However, despite this, the legislator has continuously refused to, to make a decision and, and say, this is what this means for women. So it's in the constitution in Article 26.4, which states that you can access an abortion. It's illegal, it's not permitted. However, the circumstances under which you can access it. It's within this bill that states that this is when you can actually access an abortion to terminate a pregnancy. So this bill just seeks to reinforce or reaffirm the constitutional right by having the state take its obligation to put this in law. Other aspects of the bill include safe motherhood, adolescent reproductive services and assisted reproductive technologies. Um, it's not expansive. It covers four main areas and then it has a miscellaneous provision. But it's important because maternal mortality remains a concern in this country. Maternal mortality because of, an, of abortion remains a concern in this country and it's necessary to legislate upon it. And why it's necessary to do it at a national level is because we have a devolved system of governance. And we have 47 county governments and one national government. And each, and each level of government has an obligation to provide for healthcare services, but the national government has a policy directive obligation. And if they set a policy or a standard, then the other 47 governments would be obliged to follow it and improve upon it. However, when they don't do it, if it doesn't come from national level, then you have 47 fragmented states. And we've had this divorce system since 2013, and we've had at least four counties in that period pass bills on reproductive health and rights, but the national government has stayed silent. So that means how it is right now, your rights can differ depending on where you get pregnant. If you get pregnant in one county and not another, you might be able to access a termination of pregnancy if you're in Makwini County, for instance, and not be able to access it if you're in Akuru County, which is irrational in our state. And this would be addressed by having a national government that's taking its obligation to enact this provision seriously. Another aspect that the bill covers, which is very important, is adults and reproductive health. And this is a very huge issue because anyone who follows the politics in Kenya or follows the news in Kenya knows we have a lot of unintended teenage pregnancies. We have a back to school policy for, t for girls who get pregnant while in school. We have high numbers of teenage pregnancies every year, particularly this becomes very important during the exam year, which is either your last year of primary school or your last year of secondary school. That's when the media highlights it. However, it's a continuous problem. This is obviously occasioned by the fact that we have a very weak information systems when it comes to sexuality education. However, just like with abortion, while our government is happy to provide post-abortion care and is happy to sweep up what has happened 
after you do it by yourself at home or in unsafe circumstances with teenage pregnancies they have the same policy we'll find a way to get you back in school but we won't give you the right information to ensure that you can avoid or delay pregnancy that you might not be ready for so it's this disbalance of always trying to fix it after the fact and recognizing you have a problem but not actually putting in policies in place to address the issue and not the circumstances or not the symptoms of the issue. So we're always curing symptoms, but never actually the disease. This is continuously what we've been doing with abortion, with pregnancy, with adolescents. So this bill is trying to cure some of those issues. It would be difficult for me to say at this point that the bill is in itself perfect. It's going through a point of um, public participation. And we have had a lot of inputs from civil society, from medical practitioners, from unions to strengthen its content. And that's what's important for us, making sure that it can actually meet Article 27, Article 26, and Article 43 of our constitution. However, at this point, like Hema has said, there is a lot of misinformation around it, which is becoming very problematic because now we can't discuss the issues of women and girls or the state of women's rights in this country in a meaningful way. So it's been termed as an abortion bill, which it's not, because it discusses safe motherhood, discusses adolescent reproductive health, assisted technologies. It's been termed as a bill that um, is teaching children how to have sex, which it's not, because actually it has a very abstinent only content. So even that is quite inaccurate. So a lot of it is based on a lot of inaccuracies. Even the clause in termination of pregnancies is not far from the constitutional clause. It has the same exact grounds as the constitution. Only addition is if their fetal abnormalities would be incompatible with life after birth, which makes sense for the most part medically to terminate that pregnancy. So those are the things that it's just a lot of misinformation. So what is being propagated at this stage is that people are seeking to have abortion on demand which is not true and the bill does not allow this. However, if we don't have a national standard on how this can be accessed, we will continue to have a situation whereby most women who access public health facilities can't access a safe abortion. They can only then go after having an unsafe abortion to access post-abortion care, which will then be free and will cost the government and will cost taxpayers, but not to deal with the issue of somebody does not want to be pregnant, let's address it before they have to almost kill themselves and then bring themselves to us. So those are some of the main issues that the bill is trying to address. I would also like to note on the issue of malicious litigation that Hema mentioned, it's happening quite consistently here. And we have a number of cases that we're now fighting. One of which was derived from the My Stops Kenya ban in 2016. Um, so My Stops Kenya was, was um, prohibited from continuing to provide services as a result of a petition by Citizen Go in Kenya. And this was eventually withdrawn by the Kenya Medical and Dentist Practitioners Council, the board which actually would have been the regulator withdrew this, but this has gone to court in two separate cases. One of which has been brought by Citizen Go again, but not really Citizen Go because they're not a registered entity in Kenya, but by the leader or the head of Citizen Go in Kenya, An Kyoko. And some of the questions that we continuously have to ask ourselves as a movement is how to manage not just the misinformation, but the continuous attacks in very many different fora. And it's been somewhat difficult to manage because it's continuously happening with almost endless resources, but it's also showing us, as Hema said, the, it is a global agenda. So it might seem organic to Kenya, but it's happening in Kenya, it's happening in South Africa, it's happening in Uganda, it's happening in uh, Ethiopia, in Nigeria. So it's that we're dealing with a global agenda in a localized way that might not actually work as effectively for us because we're fighting and not seeing how it's happening everywhere else and where the endless pool of resources are coming from to ensure this agenda continues. And thank you, Rosebell. Thank you. Thank you, Nerima. That is very, very uh, important what you've highlighted um, in the terms of like connecting the what's happening locally, national and uh, global. And often what we hear these groups, they really, really uh, weaponize religion as a way to, to, to get into different um, um, 
policy makers, uh, you know, officers and everywhere um, as a way to deny women's their, uh, women their rights. And also there's a lot of disinformation around like, this is what the West is telling you to do. But, you know, um, there's this constant denial that women have a voice in our, in, in, in our countries, that women can decide if you give them the right uh, conditions, but also uh, really intentional uh, overlooking the fact that the very laws we are debating, they have, these are colonial laws. Criminalization of termination of abortion is colonial. It is not an indigenous law that, that started this. So when, when foreign organizations say, oh, this is uh, to, to decriminalize that, is foreign. I think that we have to continue to work on that on that front around disinformation and recognizing that these are colonial laws, and and also bringing the fact that many African countries have taken steps to decolonize their law uh, regimes. Uh, recently, Rwanda decriminal uh, decriminalization in Rwanda, for example, where they have looked at their um, uh, legal system, their penal code, uh, and and trying to to reverse some of the harmful laws that were in. Enacted and 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 put over a national well-being by colonial laws. We we've also seen, of course, situations like in um, in uh, Ethiopia, where you know decriminalize of uh, decriminalization of abortion actually reduced massively maternity ma maternal mortality in Ethiopia. That it was one of the highest maternal mortality. But when when they took a step to decriminalize uh, abortion, uh, and, and it it brought down the numbers. And this is because also decriminalization Decriminalization comes with other services like uh, people are free to get contraception. These very organizations that, uh, that, that after abortion um, rights are also against sexual edu sexuality education. They are against women taking contraception and governments providing this contraception. So I'll go to Adam uh, to really take us through how um, the sophistication of such a, a scheme, you know, the uh, uh, Citizen Go started in 2003. We have Christian Voice uh, in the UK. How uh, they have to have mastered this somewhere else, then they come to Africa ha having mastered these tactics. Can you go through that ideology and the tactics that they're trying to, import, to, to export here? Thank you. Absolutely. So, so um, I mean, first, I should say I feel really kind of honored to be on a panel with all these brilliant women, and um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think what, I, what I'm the way I was going to tell the story is really just my quite limited experience of it, which is the last year in the spring, I was at the World Congress on Families in Italy, which Tim I've talked about, um, pretending to be a potential funder for these kind of ultra-conservative groups in order to try to better understand how they operate and what they tell me. And, and I was there largely because I'm a man and so I can get access to certain kinds of space that my female colleagues would be shy out of. And I just wanted to tell you about two people who I spoke to there and what they told me. And the first is this guy, Ignacio Arsuaga, who is the founder of Citizen Go um, and Astio Ir, as we, um, as, as Ken and I told you. And I had two long conversations with him in which I was offering him huge amounts of money. I was telling him I'd inherited lots and lots of money and I was interested in influencing European elections with it and asking him how he would spend it if I gave it to him. And that's why I got him to tell me various things. Um, and I think the first thing to say, and, and this kind of answers your question, Rosebud, to some extent, is that what was very clear to me from that conversation is that he understood that he was taking a model from America, the model you might um, have heard of called super PAC. So a PAC is a political action committee. A super PAC is a super political action committee which attempts to influence the elections in America by driving debate usually in a very polarized way in a particular direction. And they were sort of invented partly so that people could say things that political candidates wouldn't want to be seen saying. So they could say the controversial thing, they could drive debate, they could run the personal attack that a politician on their side, who was their ally, could stand away from and you know kind of quietly agree, but not ruin their own reputation by fighting dirty like that. So they sort of invented as a way to channel money to people who can fight dirty without the politicians themselves getting blood on their hands. And so, um, so you know, that was the first thing. And he said this quite explicitly to me. So I asked him you know, about how the money I gave him would help the various different far-right parties right across Europe. So we talked about 
the Alliance for Deutschland in Germany, which is an inheritor organization in a sense to the Nazi party. We talked about the far right party in Austria. We talked about the far right party in Hungary, in Spain, as we've already heard about and so on. And, um, uh, and in Italy and absolutely, you know, he said, yes, we have close relationships with all these parties, which are remember violently in some cases and certainly very racist parties. Um, they have close relationships with all these parties and that the best way for me as a British person to support them would be by giving money to his organization so that he can run a big campaign in those countries attacking their opponents. So he wouldn't say explicitly vote for the AFD, but he'd use my money to attack every other party to drive voters towards the AFD in Germany, for example. Um, he also talked about how a good friend of his at Vox, this guy Javier Ortega Smith, who's a very senior figure at Vox, um, is secretly, he said, a phalangist, in other words, a Spanish fascist, but you know, don't tell anyone that. Um, so he's very conscious and aware of the far right connections of his supporters and the racist histories of the people he works with. Um, and that's, I think, important to think about in the context of this kind of colonial exporting of these ideas to Kenya and other places around the world. Um, and then the other person that I wanted to talk about was this guy called Darian Rafi, who's quite a secretive figure, but I had a good long conversation with him. And Darian Rafi is a close advisor and good friend of um, Ignacio Arsuaga. And he's, um, he's an American and he has this kind of background as one of the shadowy figures involved in the Tea Party movement and very particularly involved in the kind of high tech end of the spectrum. So for example, in 2010, he built the Republican Party website. So he's a very senior kind of technological operative of the American right. Um, he is connected to lots and lots of different sort of Tea Party type organizations in the States. He worked fundraising for Donald Trump in 2016, and he's got connections to kind of various organizations, but he's employed by the, um, the, the essentially the organization which runs the World Congress on Families. So it's his job to advise these various groups around the world. And the thing that he told me, which I think worried me most, was the project he was working on when I met him last year, which was a project where they do what's called geofencing, where they draw a kind of technological boundary around a particular area. So the example he gave was a Trump rally. And then they can get all the data out of the phones of everyone who goes into that space. And then they can find out lots about what they watch on YouTube. He said, we'll know what your favorite Netflix show is. Um, all this other information, they can follow your home, your home to your house, they've got your address, and then they can decide based on the information they've got, whether to remind you to vote on election day, what messages to target, target you with, and so on. And since we wrote up this story about him doing this, other publications in the States have revealed that he and Steve Bannon, who was Trump's advisor, who worked with organizations he works with, um, have been using technology just like that to gather data from, for example, everyone going into a church in Ohio. So that for the US elections, they can suddenly know that all these church goers in Ohio, very detailed data on their lives, um, where they live, what their favorite shows are, huge amounts of data, process that, and decide what messages to target at them, whether to encourage them to vote for their candidate, often encourage them not to vote um, in an election, push them toward believing particular kinds of things, and so on. And um, now we don't know for sure that that particular technology has been exported through Citizen Go into the rest of the world. We do know that Darian Rafi, who developed it, is on the end of a phone advising Ignacio Raswaga at least once a month and often more than that. He's a key technological advisor to Citizen Go. So you might well assume that at some point Citizen Go will start using that kind of very high tech technology to drive their agenda in places like Kenya and around the world. And I, I think the final thing I want to say though is that what this is all about is really quite wealthy people in Western countries, both in the States and also, you know, I went to Spain after that and I interviewed people about Citizen Go there on people on the kind of Spanish far right who were very clear that this was, you know, essentially wealthy Spanish people supporting it and giving it money, working very hard to drive their agenda around the world. And I think we need to understand that it's a new kind of Thank you, uh, Adam, for that. Um, 
I think that, um, that it's really ironic that the most anti-Black lives groups across the world find themselves in Africa funding anti reproductive rights and that has to be seen because often people think that these are just you know um you know funding and you know they always position morality and saving Africa and women as the thing but actually in their own countries they really do not support black lives in those particular countries so that 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 is really um something that we have to look at. And uh, I think Ruth uh, in the beginning talked about the class issue and the fact that these are rich, powerful people. They could say one thing and do uh, something else differently. And no one would know and their lives would be unimpacted. So being cognizant of, on the racial and class uh, dynamics of this conversation on uh, access to reproductive um, health for African women and girls. Uh, I'll bring in some questions that were sent in earlier. Um, back to Kenya, F F Fidel, Fidel Karanja asks, uh, does legalization of abortion in Kenya really address the root cause of teenage pregnancy or should we not should we not address the root cause i don't know uh nerima if you could speak to that about uh, what he means of root cause or what or what you think is root cause and then how does um decriminalization of abortion and uh, and and giving services uh, come into that thank you um thank you rosbell and thank you fidel um so well it wouldn't be legalization it would be decriminalization because the constitution already has a provision on access to safe and legal abortion. So that point is moot. Um, but in terms of addressing the root cause of teenage pregnancy, so as I said, the issue is kind of a continuum of failing to address diseases and trying to cure symptoms. So if you refuse to provide children with information in school that would ensure that they can safely navigate the sexual space, then they're likely to get into and an intended pregnancy. Further, if you, provide, if you refuse then to provide contraceptives, which often happens for adolescents within this country where they can't access contraceptives, then they're, unlike, then they're likely to reach an unintended pregnancy. Therefore, the issue isn't to legalize necessarily abortion, the issue is to provide reproductive health services and information to people on a continuum. Understanding that from birth up until death, people have different needs, for their productive health and you need to do that. So the biggest problem we have, or one of the biggest problems we have is that between zero and 18, you are a child and then 18, all of a sudden you're an adult and all of these things accrue to you within the difference of one day in your life. So all of a sudden you can get everything you ever needed before in one day, the day you turn 18. However, in that period of time, you have been evolving as a person. Therefore you require information as you go through the stages in your life, you also require access to services. So if you had that, that in place, sexuality education in schools, access to contraceptives, you might reduce the numbers of unintended pregnancies. Not to say that you will never have any unintended pregnancies, but you would reduce the numbers. What we are seeing is we are seeing consistent problems in terms of numbers. And we're seeing consistently the state is responding in one way. They will treat the symptom only and not the root causes, as you said. So with abortion, we will not provide you with abortions in public health facilities, but we will ensure if you do do one outside, not only will we not criminalize you, because often women aren't criminalized when they have an unsafe abortion and they go to a facility, we will ensure you have post-abortion care. So we're willing to treat you after you've almost killed yourself, but not to make sure you have access to a service you require, or not to make sure you have access to contraceptives or access to information about your reproductive health beforehand. And those are the issues. Similar with teenage pregnancies. If they have the right information, access to contraceptives, then we would probably avoid the high numbers of unintended pregnancies. So it's not to simplify the issue, it's a continuum of care that we need to actually address in the country. Thank you, Nerima. We have a question from Sande Ojara. Uh, let's keep it uh, short because there are many questions. I'll ask Ruth, how do we keep our girl child during this COVID lockdown? Uh, now that they are not in school, uh, how do we keep them safe? Uh, and was the school closure necessary? So Ruth, if you can talk about around safety of young girls uh, now that they're out of school.
Oh, thank you so much. Um, how can we keep our, our girls safe during this time of COVID? It's so sad that uh, people who are moralizing all these issues, they had already even closed doors or, or, or rather create safe havens for, for young girls. Uh, when COVID uh, struck Kenya, uh, people who were there, people who were there to help uh, people who are human rights activists and also uh, uh, community health workers, but the church had already closed its door for, 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 for people to have a refuge. So uh, for me, how, how to keep our girls safe is to continue, um, but rather it has been so much criminalized that you cannot uh, um, uh, continue teaching uh, uh, or rather giving uh, uh, young girls information on how to, on how to keep them, uh, themselves uh, safe. For, the, for, for young girls to be safe, I think we need uh, to continue uh, giving them and educating them, uh, giving them tactics on how to deal uh, with the situation if, if it may occur. And this, uh, uh, this, this is the work that uh, uh, community activists have been doing uh, in creating safe spaces for young girls to come and just uh, have a talk, to be educated, to also to learn more about their reproductive uh, uh, issues and how to deal with issues when they may arise. Because uh, what makes uh, a lot of girls in, uh, in, in, in the informal settlement to be more vulnerable, it's because they don't have information and then uh, it's so much, uh, uh, then the, 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 we don't have that uh, parent to child relationship because uh, 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 coming from an African uh, context or rather uh, uh, from a conservative uh, community where people have been so much, uh, so, uh, are so much religious, there are some issues that parents cannot talk to young girls. Um, so, uh, and uh, this is now where we create a safe spaces for girls to offer that alternative voice to start educating these young girls to create that rapport and, uh, and, and create confidence and also teach young girls on how uh, to take care of, of, of themselves. Thank you, uh, Ruth. Uh, the next question is to Hema. How should civil society organizations prepare in terms of shaping public discourse and legal reform? Thank you. Um, well, I, um, yeah, I think the, the issue of misinformation has been, you know, you, most of us have already mentioned it, uh, and I think it's key to their strategies and also uh, it should be key to our response because I think, um, well, the right to information generally so that, you know, all of us need um, information about what our rights are and how we can access them and exercise them and it's um, a really basic right and it's quite frequently overlooked but I think it's powerful because um, it really talks about what is the obligation of the state and the state officers and civil servants to provide information that is clear transparent and accurate about you know, like what are the rights that the constitution protects and how to access those, those rights. So I think um, there is so much um, inaccuracy and there's so many um, public officers are making use of their positions to give information, to, to disinform people really, and to give information that is inaccurate and that is not in line with the policies. And so I think, this, you know, fighting for a right to, you know, accurate and clear uh, information is one of the things um, that civil society organizations could um, work on. I think we also need to be um, ready to have like rapid uh, response legal teams, like rapid response lawyers to be able to respond to this um, litigation, the, the use of, of litigation um, um, to, to, you know, push back right uh, so i think that's also um, another uh, area of law uh, uh, of action sorry um and also i think there's a need the the, the debate is frequently very polarized so it's uh, black and white thinking and uh, specifically as narima very um, um brightly uh, just explained uh, it's not about 
uh, abortion, you know, uh, legalized or illegal. I mean, that is not how the thing, how things work. So, I mean, we need to provide di other different angles to the public debate. I think there's a lot of need of, um, you know, the, the, the debate is very much focused on, I think, uh, moral and religious arguments. And then we need to have here like public policy, public health, human rights, women's rights arguments and change the focus. There's ob obviously religious leaders and groups are going to have an opinion and that is obviously fine, but whether the debate should be so much focused on, on this is a question that I think we, we also need to work on to, to provide um, you know, the shades of gray between this black and white thinking and obviously abortion, um, you know, a total ban on abortion in many different countries in the world and it has been said by many different, you know, human rights mechanisms and courts um, it violates uh, women's rights because then it means that when women cannot under any circumstance um, interrupt a pregnancy even when this endangers their life or their health and um, then women end up dying um, because they cannot receive treatment because um, well we, we, we know this right so it's a matter of you know it is legal but then the circumstances and what's important is that women can access Thank you. Um, there's a question around um, help, you know, what, on, what do on ground activists need from funders to sustain them in raising awareness and mobilization? Then another part of this support, someone asks, um, we run a magazine that has an intentional focus on SRHR, how do we support? So between uh, Nerima and Ruth, if you can pick up on that, how do people support without yeah without making the situation worse um pick up on that quickly nerima you can go first okay thanks um how to support without making the situation worse i think some of the biggest challenges we have is that funding is very siloed so if you're going to find safe and legal abortion you'll only find that and not allow us to have discussions on safe and legal abortion, CSC, and LGBTQI, which then means we start to speak in silos. And if we could have cross movement discussions because the attacks are coming across the movement, but our responses are very siloed. So having more honest discussions among donors about not having siloed funding, about having cross movement funding, and then not, not trying to determine what intervention should look like. A lot of our interventions, sometimes there's things that might work in different contexts, but at least believing that we actually understand and have the expertise within our own continent to develop interventions and to have these discussions and you can support that the way we want to frame it. That's what I would say quickly. Ruth, uh, what would the support look like in this context? Um, for me, the support uh, will look like, because. Um, it's high time we start humanizing and giving a face to uh, uh, to the real uh, people who are being affected by all these uh, debates. And if um, support for me, it's uh, to to amplify uh, the struggles of uh, women who have been uh, affected by these issues and the global politics and also national politics and start humanizing uh, these faces you know it gives even it speaks a lot when uh, when 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 uh, when you put an issue to the face now you start so that people can understand and also can relate to it because they can see uh, truly it's also affecting them and also uh, i'll also concur with uh, nerima uh, funding and especially funding and also trickling down the resources to the grassroots and especially to the activists, community activists and community organizers who have been filling the gap in educating and also building safe havens for girls so that where they can get information uh, locally. I think it's hard to, it, 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 it will be more uh, powerful if we can continue to give resources uh, uh, directly to the, to the people on the ground to continue doing uh, uh, the amazing work that they are doing without even having, a, uh, having a resources. So we continue empowering them by uh, uh, giving directly also to them for them to be able to sustain whatever to effort they are trying to do at, uh, to, to, to cause change in the, in, the, in the communities where they are working in. Thank you, Ruth. A last question uh, to Adam. 
uh, how can we stop citizen go actions in different countries because uh, you can't work in silos? And related to that also, reproductive health is too serious a matter to be left to women's rights activists alone. How do we enlarge the circle? So if you can take those last and we go to, I see Mary's already here, uh, speak to that and we go to Mary to wrap up. Sure, I mean, on the first one, organize better than them. They are organizing a small elite of people and the way to beat them is to organize more people. And I think we've just heard how to treat that in Kenya and the answers are the same across the world. Um, and on the second, I think you're right that, you know, those of us, um, you know, who aren't women across the world need to understand that um, the war on women's rights is, A, it affects us all, and B, is a kind of key tactic of the far right across the world and a key base that they get their support from. And unless we all work together to defeat it, we will all suffer. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for those of you whom, uh, whose questions we were unable to take on. There's really a lot to take away from here. Let's continue the conversation. I see activity on Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, this should not be the final you know, talk on this conversation because we have to get women and girls their rights. Mary, I hand back to you. Thank you so much, Rosebud, and thank you to all the um, panelists. That was a fantastic discussion. Um, I think I'd echo that last point because it's a real guiding principle for us at Open Democracy. The assault on women and on women's rights is an assault on all of us. Um, it is part of a project to impose a uh, less democratic, less accountable, um, more unequal world order, and that's why um, we are engaged um, in, in challenging this backlash, um, and, and that's why um, you know, this, this matters to all of us. So uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you for your um, contributions. Um, uh, please uh, do sign up to our newsletter, opendemocracy.net forward slash newsletter. We have these um, fantastic discussions every week. You can check out our website and social media for the details. Um, if you think the type of um, journalism that Open Democracy does is important and the conversations we have at the one we had today is important, please consider supporting us, support.opendemocracy net forward slash donate. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, I hope to see many of you again uh, next week. Goodbye. <laughs>